is, is the guitar the instrument still a learning tool like are you still learning like you just talked about the humidifier is it still like you're constantly learning new things about it? Absolutely. I, I spend a lot of time watching guys playing on YouTube these days that just are never heard of them and they're absolutely incredible. There's Some of them are, I look for uh, and admire their technical prowess and not learning anything from it because they're like freaks, you know, they're just <laughs> so ridiculous. But then there's other guys that just have lessons on how to do this, how to do that stuff. I'd like chicken picking and stuff like that, right? Or yeah talking to some guy or watching some guy that that's all he knows how to do and it's amazing and different techniques like that alex has got stuff in there and you know he great videos alex has i don't think there's a song that you can't find Third, no. on youtube of someone showing you how to play the Ain't song that the truth who, who and well, that who's done I wrote. all yeah. the leg work and all the weird little nuances of that particular song to the nth degree yeah you know like where if it it was your tune you're going how the heck did he figure that out because that was kind of like a flub that i made or a bad edit or something like that and they managed to just duplicate it perfectly (laughs) yeah yeah no it it really is mind-boggling and do you spend a lot of time still learning about the guitar no i Hmm. no well i actually i take that back uh i'm doing all, all i don't I don't think I ever play in standard tuning on my acoustics anymore. Wow. I just tune it up to something. And well, there are yeah. the standards, yeah. dad, gad, and all of that crap. But I, I lately I've been just tuning it to something and trying to figure out where my fingers should go. That and that's great. been challenging. Well, that's like learning And how really to play. a lot of fun. This is the great thing about having three or four acoustics all out together, like okay. a little group of guys sitting in the corner. Yes. And I tune them all differently from each other. And you pick up and play one for an hour or so and put it down, pick up the other one. Now it's completely different. Oh, that Where is like learning. Those, You're those playing little, four guitars. Yeah, and, those and, little, you know, chord structures that I was just using on that tuning do not work on this tuning at all. Yeah, or they sound so, incredible. There's extra or, notes yeah. in them now and everything. Yeah, yeah I, completely off topic. Uh, we're on the same topic, kind of. I, uh, years ago, met Joni Mitchell. I was playing on a TV show, the Rita McNeil show or something, with Cassandra Vasek. So anyway, Joni's a guest on the show. And I kind of had six degrees of separation with her, I was told, because Will Miller from the Irish Rovers, who I'd been with, uh, told me that he taught her how to play the guitar. So that was kind of like my in. If I ever got to run into her, I'd have something to say to her. So it turns out she had the dressing room right across the room from me. And I heard her go in, heard her shut the door, and I waited 15 minutes or whatever, knocked on the door. She answers, and I introduced myself, said I'm a friend of Will Miller's, and I I just want to see if he was kidding when he said he taught you how to play the guitar. She says, come on in, right? So uh, we sat. She talked about being a waitress in Winnipeg or wherever it was. She started out, Calgary. And Will coming in with his new little troubadour band and reggae band or whatever he's doing and showed her some chords and everything but then i was asking her about her open tunings speaking of open tunings and not knowing anything about them myself so uh, but i knew she did it so uh she said yeah she says i've invented like 125 different tunings right and she says uh, check this out so she goes grabs her purse and zips it brings takes out her <laughs> opens it up and says wait a minute pulls out this little notebook that she's had since 1960 or something right and it's all handwritten and it's all different tunings and there's one that says big yellow taxi one that says blah 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 it was astounding like i was looking at a smithsonian thing and it was just sitting in her purse next to her smokes right it was (laughs) amazing so there's the open tuning story for me so when you when you do open tuning and just change things you're not playing the, the the fingering that you do the, the chord structure, that's completely different, right? Yeah. So it's like relearning the guitar all over. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of the point. <laughs> I mean, I think you, with like Bernie and with myself, we've been playing for 50 years. So it's kind of ingrained there. We put in our, never mind 10,000 hours, we put in our 30 or 40,000 hours. So to pick up an instrument, if there's such a comfortable familiarity with the instrument and you know what it's capable of doing. And then when you put it into this other condition, 
it just takes you to d different places. Uh, I, uh, my big problem is I'm, I get too excited about it <laughs> and I don't ever record and I never play the same thing the same twice. Uh, and I know I sit there and I'll play for an hour and go, oh my God, I got to put this down. This is really kind of a great idea for, for something. I'll do it tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then I come in and the guitar hasn't changed. No. And I go, you know, I strum um, it. And where did I, what was it. I yeah, doing? Famous last and then I start playing tomorrow. something else. It's so like, oh my God, this is cool. <laughs> and I lose track of it. But even if you recorded it, you might not remember how you played it. That's the other thing. So the few times that I have recorded it, I've actually shot video. So I just put my iPhone up and and record my positions my playing problem is I never remind myself of what the actual tuning is. So, <laughs> so there's a lot I of... gotta get this together <laughs> That's somehow. Right. You, you forgot what it's tuned at. Yeah, it's tuned Damn, at. That I almost would be a got good there. Thing to write down. <laughs> <laughs> but do you good. know what you're looking for when you try this open tuning and just play different chords? I'm not looking for anything specifically. I'm for me. I'm just looking to play. Uh, I'm looking to work the, this left hand a lot. I'm working, trying to work my right hand. I'm picking more just to keep this going. I've had issues with uh, psoriatic arthritis for like 15 years, which has been great. I'm, I'm totally un, under control and uh, the medications have worked well for me in that time. 65, maybe it's getting a little more challenging, but the more I play, the better my hands feel. Uh, I like to do all this other stuff for other musicians and I get a lot of requests to play on other people's material from John Mayall to Fu Manchu. So it's a widespread uh, and it's a great uh, experimental kind of process for me. I get to do exactly what I want to do and if they don't like it, they don't like it. If they like it, great. Uh, but I get to be not Alex Lifeson from Rush. I get to be, you know, this guitar player who hears something and arranges a part the way he thinks it will advance the song, much the way I do in Rush. But it's different when you're working with different kinds of music and different personalities, and you get a sense of what they're trying to get across uh, in the context of mm -hmm. that song. The thing I did with John Mayall recently, I got a request uh, to play on his upcoming record. Now, the guy's 85 years old. He's toured forever since the 50s. Yeah. And he's, he's the same age as my mom. And uh I when I when I got re when I got the request to do this, they said, you know, we'll get the material to you. He's just on tour right now doing some dates, <laughs> but he'll be back in the studio next week. It was in like the studio. Oh my god. <laughs> so the guy's in the Middle East wow. doing dates, oh. but he's coming back to LA to to get back into the studio to finish oh. his new record it was like amazing it's, it's 150th album right the, yeah, yeah it is <laughs> exactly. but the fact that i i got this request to play on the record put me in with these amazing guitar players who historically played mm -hmm. in the blues breakers and i'm i'm a tiny little part of that fraternity sure and are. it was i i felt a real sense of honor uh, when I was asked to do that. So, so okay, so here's here's a, 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 something that I don't really do, a blues, like very, very traditional blues. And I listened to the track, and it was pretty kind of a pretty standard blues sort of arrangement. And I thought, well, what, what can I do that's not going to be too intrusive? Because this is John, mm. and he's singing, and he's mm -hmm. playing keyboards. That's That's the core of what this song is. How can I work around it that's going to enhance that without getting in the way of anything? And so I did a bunch of stuff. I did a couple of acoustic tracks uh, in Nashville tuning, uh, really plucking. So it almost sounded like a harmonica at, at some points. And I did a, a kind of a regular, you know, kind of bluesy guitar rhythm track. And I did some solos. So I created all of this stuff that they could pick and choose whatever they wanted to use. Uh, and I thought that that's really an important way to approach these sort of projects 
to give the artist uh, some uh, choices, what they can use, what, what they're not really interested in. I can push the limits a little bit in the way I like to think about things and create sounds that are perhaps not what would be expected. And in most of the projects that I've done lately, that's been the case. I've submitted stuff that they never thought that they'd never heard right. in their minds when they were writing these songs. Uh, less traditional and, you know, from someplace in, in left field a little bit. Do you have any idea what they were looking for when they come to you? Like, do you think a lot of people just say, let's go to Alex because he played with Rush. We want that Rush kind of guitar thing. Or do you think they're looking for something completely different and know that you can do something completely different? I think different? mostly it's because of my reputation. I mean, Rush has, you know, toured for 41 years and we had a lot of notoriety, especially in the last dozen years or so with our broader popularity. Uh, I think people that perhaps wrote Rush off in the earlier days begrudgingly came around and said, you know what, they lasted this long and they're still working. There must be something there. So I think initially that's what people come to me for. But I I've, I've found that people who are really kind of in the know, who are musicians that really know what's out there, what they're looking for, uh, invariably it comes down to that. The stuff that I've done with Marco Miniman, for example, um, like he's a very progressive player. He's a he's a multi instrumentalist. Uh, he's very good on every instrument that he plays. Like some stuff that we've worked on, he's sent me the, the basic tracks that he's put guitar on, and I've written back and said, mm -hmm. "Marco, yeah. there's nothing for me to do on mm -hmm. here. These guitar tracks sound awesome." Mm -hmm. He said, "That's okay. I'm going to get rid of them all, and you just do your." Thing. <laughs> oh my goodness! And I like I'm no, I don't want to do that. Uh -huh. I I really. I love what you did. It sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll be a little bit different, but that's mm -hmm. kind of what I would do. If... Yep. So then I try to find atmospherics that I could add to it, enhance it. I don't have to be the big shot solo <laughs> guy. I don't want to be that. In fact, I'd rather be, oh my God, what's that what's dreamy that sound? Yeah. That's a guitar? Really? Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of stuff I, I really like to do. And excel in, you know, like as, as well as being a player. This is Alex being humble because he's talking about we, he's talking about Rush and everything. Not mentioning the fact that he's in every guitar player poll at or near the top of the list mm -hmm. every time. And for years, he's my idol. He's everybody else's idol. He's a, But we go back to Donny Tran and we, he's the one that gave us the, the spark and whatever. But uh, Alex is known for being Alex. You know, like they know him through Rush because... He's been in one band all his life, this, which is another reason why they're awesome. And uh, so singularly, as a guitar player, if he was in any other band, he would be the guy in that band too, like that everybody would go to see because he's incredible. He's in, inventive, creative. And when they call up Alex to play on a John Mayall record, they know the name is going to get John into another uh, mm -hmm. demographic of maybe people that are Rush fans going, oh my God, I'll buy anything that Alex is on. But in the meantime, Alex w wouldn't be included on the album. I mean, they don't put it in the newspaper that they've asked him to play. Right. If it didn't cut it, it wouldn't be on the record, right? So Alex, they know he's going to do great. And then he he's very diligent. You know, he wouldn't send them something like he said. He wasn't happy with one track. He sends them a whole bunch of stuff. And this is a blues thing, you know, G, C, and D, you know, like, so how many times he's also this thing, he's thinking about Eric Clapton, Peter Green, and it, it, Jimmy Page or whoever, those, that guys that John Mayle either discovered or made famous. And uh, Alex is in that legacy. And he's also in that realm before that. They just had, took 150 albums for them to call him because he was out in the road with Rush. <laughs> One of the first songs we played live in 1968, the, the first gig that we played mm -hmm. in this church of a basement where yes. we knew eight songs and just played them over and over mm -hmm. was Snowy Wood, one of John Mayall's songs. Wow. There you go. I mean, so it was a full circle. Yeah. That, was, that was pretty cool. And my, our opening act, or our opening song was Hideaway off the Blues Breakers album. Yeah. But it, 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 it was a Freddie King song, but... Uh, yeah, so there you go. Yeah, John was everywhere. That Blues Breakers album killed us at our age. Yeah.
if I remember correctly, we once had a conversation and you told me that you really didn't go through the traditional blues. Like that's not where you learn no. your guitar, which, mm -mm. which surprised me because I just automatically assumed that rock guitarists had to go through No, blues. you just have to listen to him. No, I don't know where he came from. No, I'm, se I'm like second or third generation, I would say. You know, my influences were Hendrix and Townsend well, and Jimmy Page. Yeah. And so they were all second generation blues players. They mm -hmm. learned from, from, from the original players. Uh, so stylistically, that's where I learned. The and I'd love to play and that electric blues. I'm not a root guy stuff. either. I started just yeah. where you did too. You and I are very common, I think, in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly I had some good looks, but we come from the same place. I think we've had a lot of the same experiences growing up, not only as as young budding guitarists, but as guys, as teenagers yeah. and, oh, and yeah. guys. Yeah, uh, There's been a, a lot of parallels between Bernie and me over the years. Our, our love of music, the way we look at our instrument, the passion, and an unspoken passion. I, I see it in him. Playing in the um, in the Dexter's all those years at the Orbit Room, I mean, this is beautiful. What what Bernie just said about me and all that all that crap, but <laughs> I, I I now gonna do my bit. I learned a lot from him about ensemble work, about playing in a band, and when to be dynamic and when to take a back seat and and not feel like you're not providing enough. Like I really learned about the, the R&B feel and the soul feel and the nuance of a clean guitar sound, which I didn't grow up with. I was always a dirty, you know, player. Maybe not as dirty as some, but it was, I always needed that sustain and noise. And yet he had this beautiful, clean tone and it worked so well and it was clear and the notes were, were articulate. And I really learned a, a lot from from you so is that an easy that. thing to learn Thank from somebody you. else like you you watch them and you say i like what he's doing there's a joke about guitar <laughs> players how many guitar players does it take to screw in a light bulb uh, six one to screw in the light bulb and five to say ah, i could do that <laughs> so and i think that's a, a very common thing with guitar players there there's a there's a basic insecurity that guitar players feel that they're not good enough or they're not as good as the next guy rather than looking at what the next guy does and thinking oh my god that's not something that i do but i'd love to be able to do that and i think i could incorporate it in what i do and that's about learning to be humble and realistic and reasonable about how you approach the instrument and where you want to go with it okay so Mm -hmm. That's another thing we have in common, for sure. Like, Bernie, when, when I interviewed you back in, I think, episode number nine. Okay. Um, number so, nine. <laughs> so you basically made your career being a studio musician. Um, yeah, I know you had your solo work and mm -hmm. you did other band stuff. Yep. But I don't know if that's isolated. And at the same time, when I think of Rush and all the years you spent on the road, and I know you're touring with other people... I don't know if you're isolated there too because you're just playing and doing going from one gig to another and uh, you know and so in both cases how often do you have that chance to look at observe other people and say I need to learn how to do that not as often as it used to be that's for sure the 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 golden years the sponge years you know when we're in our teens and uh all that stuff, and then there's guys older than us like Triano and and the Young Street Strip and places you can go to to see these guys that are seemed like a hundred years older than you back then, but they're maybe five to ten years older than you. But they're from the Soul Group. They played with the Detroit bands that would come in and play at the original Blue Note, and they knew how to read music if some artist showed up, right, and things like. But then the clean guitar sound and all that kind of stuff and the two drummers and whatever it was it was just uh, that era that we grew up in if if you were amenable to looking and learning every band you went to see there i i was just like a sponge you know like then when i got to be the cocky 17 18 year old guy after playing for two or three years when i thought 
I was the hot kid on the block at that point because I probably had the loudest amp. You know, I was about why. <laughs> and then, uh, so then it was like you'd go and then you're into that. I could, I don't know. That's okay, I guess. You know, my band's better than your band because we used to play at all the band shows, right? All the sound shows. And there'd be a prize, you know, a guitar pick or something at the right. end of the, of the <laughs> contest. So, uh, so we'd see all that stuff, and you know, and the roadies or everybody else in the band, your girlfriends and everything, and all going, "You guys are way better than those guys," you know, everything like that. So you're getting your your uh, humility is kind of taking a back seat. But then, you know, I remember like seeing Peter Frampton with Humble Pie back in the day when I thought I was kind of not happening, like I was happening, right in my mind, eighteen, seventeen, eighteen. So I go see Humble Pie, and here's Peter Frampton playing these incredible jazz influenced licks over I don't need no doctor like a, a loud loud E A and B song with Stevie Marriott singing his bum off and uh, here's this guy with a black Les Paul plugged into a high watt amp full distortion or like that but playing these incredible runs and things like that and I had my tail between my legs when I got home and, and bought that album and digested everything I possibly could that I thought I could use in the future. There, you know, there's some things that are so signature with these right. guys. You just go, I can't play that because it's, it's that guy that plays that lick. So, but there were other things like finger exercises for one thing. I learned about the baby finger that day. And, uh, then Johnny winter at, at Massey hall. First time I saw him in 1970, I was very, I was in tears watching him play thinking I suck. I will never, ever, ever be that good. I was at that same show. Okay. He wore the black cape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought exactly the same. Sitting wherever I was up yeah. in the upper balcony. Me too. I'll never be that good. No. No. Because he played like 64 bars and not repeating a lick. And then he'd just saunter up to the mic go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another 64 bars again. Right? You go, please stop. You're killing me. Yeah. Uh, that was the show. <laughs> Did you feel that way ever? Uh, yeah, at that very same show, wow. I I was I remember feeling really discouraged watching him because <laughs> I thought you know, it. yeah, guitar is hard uh -huh. and you seem to go. Your progress on the instrument is measured in eons. <laughs> it's like you're on a long plateau forever, and you don't seem to improve, and you're trying so hard. And then suddenly one day, you could play those few things that you couldn't oh, the day before. That's so it's cool. like, oh my God, mm -hmm. I, got, I have it. Was there... And then you'd be on that plateau for the next however long until the next incremental improvement. Yeah. So to see somebody, a professional, you know, like, yeah. like him. And there were a lot of great bands that came back, came oh, through um, Procol Harum. I remember oh, Robin Trower, oh, Sound. Him. Yeah. Was was so uh -huh. fantastic. Yeah, Rory um, Gallagher and Shane. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had we had the the pleasure to play uh, with Rory on our or one of our very first tours. Did you? Um, that guy was amazing. Yes, he really was a pioneer. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot. He influenced a lot of players. He did. And he was a joy to be around. He was that's a wonderful nice person. Oh, that's the great. whole band, the, all the guys in his band in were great. Taste? Was it Taste? Taste, yeah. yeah. Wow. It, um, I remember in Memphis, we, we, we were on tour. and we were playing in Memphis, we had a night off. And I don't know how many nights we ended up in one of our rooms drinking uh, whiskey and, and staying up late. Uh, and, but this one time in Memphis... You know, home of the blues and all of that mm. stuff. We we were up all night and we went out at six o'clock in the morning to have breakfast. Yeah, um, I was surprised that we were still hungry. At that yeah, point. really. But we went out <laughs> and we we found a little dive. Had three or four tables and bright fluorescent lights, <laughs> and we sat down. We had you know some breakfast, and we talked about guitar and about music. And I remember we were talking about. Neil Young, and I learned something from him talking about Neil Young. I always liked Neil Young as a songwriter. I was never really a cr crazy about his guitar style. Uh, it just stylistically didn't move me. Right. 
works great for him and I get it. He's totally unique. And this is what Rory is, is, was te- was saying to me. He said, yeah, but listen to how he plays what he plays. You know, where's that coming from? It's coming from really inside of him and nowhere else. Mm. And that's the thing that you've always got to recognize and be aware of wow. that everyone has their source and no one's the same. And you might like something you might not like something stylistically but you got to respect it and you got to understand that it's pure and it's honest and that that stayed with me from that that moment i tell you i remember exactly the way that little diner Mm. dive looked like what the lighting was like and what his face was like talking to me and saying that that's honestly it was i won't say it was like an epiphany but it was a lesson to me uh, in humility and and just being more open minded. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that he was story. A, he was a great guy. Mm. He was such a great guy. That's neat to hear. And amazing on stage, just such a ball of fire. He, you know, we we did all these dates, and then there was a little bit of a break. He went home, and they came back. We picked up the tour, and he brought me a collection of Flann O'Brien's books, very well known Irish novelist, and I thought here's this yeah. guy who doesn't really know yeah. me i mean we're opening for them on this tour i'm i'm 20 20 years 21 years old and he had the consideration mm-hmm. to go and buy me yeah. he thought a about collection while of he was books on his while he was off. on his on his yeah. day off yeah yeah to bring to me and that stayed with me forever mm-hmm I just oh, those are the little things. I was boy. heartbroken when yeah. when he died. Oh, a lot of people were, and I, I wish I'd met him. I, yeah, I'm glad you did. When when That's you talk about story, the competition and and saying I could do that or I'm better than that or whatever, and then realizing that there are people who are better than you. But was there a point where you thought, "Wow, I've reached an amazing plateau"? Like, did you, do you ever well, get confident in both of your Well, levels? Alex was saying, like, you, it's very, very gradual incline, and then one day you go, oh, my God, I actually played that thing I've been thinking about forever. Or, more importantly, it fit in the right place when, <laughs> when I played it, right? You know, like, then, because in your mind, I'm sure Alex is always the same way, too. Like, you're eight bars ahead of yourself. Like, you're trying to, if you're soloing, you're trying to build a solo, right? You don't start up at the, the, the climax and then... Uh, right work backwards you know that would be really bad (laughs) so uh i'm always thinking ahead of myself you know and it's not pre-planned or anything because every time i play a solo my main idea after all the years on the road with bands and everything like that is i'm trying to keep the guys in the band interested when i play every night so i playing for them they're my audience first and foremost because i don't want anybody to quit the band and i don't want them to think i suck Plus, I want to get better. My, my dream is to be the worst guy in the band all the time so I can get better. So, um, but it's that thing you're asking where you, you don't realize it at the time other than something will fall into place. Like you played it. It's part of your repertoire. Then your repertoire gets wide enough that you could actually drive the bus when you're playing a guitar solo because you have the capability of reaching for something that you know, it's in your fingers now and it's come together in the right sequence. And it's part of, you know, sometimes it's a short piece. Sometimes it's part of a really long thing. And it's, it's a, you know, it's segue into something else. So, and then back Johnny Winter, who started like we thought, okay, that's fine. You can play four bars. I, I think I might quit now, but <laughs> then he played for 64 and it just made it build. And then he'd scream in the mic, play for another five minutes. And it just kept getting weirder and better and better and better and better. And then to the point where he made you cry. You were so overwhelmed. It was just, that was the only other way you could express it. Other than, you know, crap in your pants or something. You know, like it was one or the other. I chose to cry. And But that always motivated you to get better. <laughs> Not that day. <laughs> <laughs> nope. No, so, I had to get over that one. Really? That had such oh an impact? Oh my God. Profound profound a Triano, on the other hand when when i first saw him i was it was 19 it was the first band i ever saw live actually was the mandalas that's a really nice baptism so in the high school gym in burlington 1967 66 and uh so i'm 13 and uh basically 
I'd been playing for two years, but learning for two years. I'm not really playing, but I'm in a band, of course, with the eight song repertoire that, you know, we play over and over again, exactly the same thing as Alex was talking about. So um, then uh, I see this guy, but rather than frighten me and depress me and make me cry and stuff, it was thrilling, like that whole band, the whole experience of seeing that band with Whitey and George Oliver and, and Joey Chirofsky on keyboards and Donnie Elliott on bass and strobe light, never seen a strobe light before in my life and the striped suits and everything. So it's a, a total experience, but Donnie stood out even amongst all of that crazy show I was looking at. Donnie was like, I was riveted to this guy. So I came home that night. That was the first night I ever shaved. Like it's one of those nights when, when Alex is talking about thinking about the fluorescent light and the tables in the deli and all that stuff. I, I shaved that night. It was the first time I went to Central. I remember handing the guy my ticket. It's all in hindsight, but it's because I saw Triana. So I go home. My mom's waiting at the top of the stairs like she always did when I went out, making sure I got home okay. And uh, I says, Mom, come on downstairs for a second. She sits in her chair in the living room. And I said, Mom, remember this name, Don Troiano. And she went, what happened? I went, yeah, that's the most incredible thing I ever saw tonight or heard in my life was this guy. Wow. And I said, he's going to be famous one of these days. And uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> did, did you go see He's like my god did you go see him like did you go to see that show because of him or did you know no, anything knew about nothing him? about it knew nothing about wow. the band never even heard of them no it was like student council presents you know and i was old enough to go grade nine yeah i'm going to a dance there's a band playing you know so and there it was them and then you know and then i'd go see a band like the last words who were the complete opposite of the Mandala. They were like a pop band. and uh, But they were awesome too. So I'd see Donnie freaking people out with these sounds. And we saw the first trainer, big trainer amps we'd ever seen in our life. And when he turned on the red light, he had two lights. And when he turned on the switch, it went green. And I was like, okay, what does that do? You know, and then everybody in the, my friends, you know, the four of them that played guitar, they were going, I heard from somebody, it's called a distortionator. That's what he's got in with the <laughs> guitar, right? So, and then, you know, but then I go see the last words and they're all plugged into their brand new Fender amps and stuff and they're playing really clean, great harmonies and everything. But there's another guy, Graham Box, played a beautiful Telecaster and just sat back, played the cleanest rhythm chords I'd ever seen. He had beautiful cording, the odd little ditty on the guitar and everything like that. So there's... He, he uh, Graham on one end and Donnie on the other. And it's like Alex is talking about. If you have an open mind at that point, it's before I was cocky, right? So I'm the sponge guy. And uh, so you're just not only watching, you're feeling. And that's what happens. You know, it's like the YouTube things. I see all these freak, freakish people. I don't get anything out of it other than amazement and a headache and stuff, you know, but there's other guys play four notes and I just go, I'm going to watch that guy again. I like that, you know, that's it. So I should introduce you to, because <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Oh, okay. But um, <laughs> a few months ago, I asked Bernie if, if um, we could do an episode for my podcast playing tribute to Dominic Triano. And I said, can you maybe ask somebody else to come along with you and we can talk about Dominic? And you said, oh, I know just a person, Alex Lyson. And here we are a few months later, and there's Bernie and there's Alex. Bernie who? Bernie Labai. <laughs> oh, sorry. yes, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie Finkelstein. No, I don't think so. <laughs> sorry. So a few months later, here we are, Bernie Labai and Alex Lyson sitting here in my living room with our sound technician, Gary Vaughn, who's helping us today. Um, and I, I want to talk about Dominic because I thought he was a really special person. I actually didn't really see him play that much. But as a person, he, he was uh, an, an unbelievable person to me in how giving he was. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Alex the story where 
one of the first few times I had met him or he, he'd called me on the phone and asked me what I was doing. And, and I said, oh, I was thinking about doing a DVD for my TV series, but I don't know how to do this. And he said, let me see what I can do. And the next thing he knew, within a week, he had set up an appointment with the distributor and said, on Friday, meet me at this building and uh, let's have, go have a ch- chat. And I'm thinking, huh. you, you hardly know me. Yeah. <laughs> this is Dominic Chan. But mm-hmm. he, he was that kind of a person. So I always felt this incredible respect for him. And, and, and every time I met a musician who played with Dominic, I just felt like there was a some sort of a connection for some reason, because they always had nice things to say about Donnie the person. So that's how this this little gathering has happened. Alex, tell me about your first encounter with Dominic Triano. Much like Bernie's, it was 1967. Uh, I was 13 years old, coming up on my 14th birthday in August. So this was at Centennial Arena for Canada Day. And I think it was actually June 30th Very nice. when the gig was. Uh, Centennial Arena obviously was a new arena built that year. It was at Finch and Bathurst. Uh, and it was a big deal. The Mandela were playing. I don't remember who else was playing at that show. I went to see the Mandela. Uh, because you knew who they were. So you well, didn't I, know I, about I, them? I, okay. Yeah, I'd heard of them. Me. They were sort of the one of the first Toronto bands to go to Los Angeles okay. and re- they went to beyond yeah. Barry. Yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> yes. You know, so they must be something That's right. special. They had enough gas from the car yeah. to get there. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. That and was Love a, Itis yeah. was out and you know and opportunity. So, yeah. Opportunity yeah. and uh so I went to the gig. That just to expand a little bit on what Bernie was saying, that was such a Incredible time for music in Toronto for local bands. The Stitch and Time, Ugly Ducklings, the Poppers, the Yeomen, all of these bands that were around and you could God. see them, you know, all over the place. Mm-hmm. You could go to Yorkville, you could go downtown, you could go to York University. I remember there was a big rock show at York, York University where they had bands set up in different rooms. You just walked through rooms Neat. and you saw the Yeomen in one room, you saw the Poppers in another room. Oh. And, uh, it was a fabulous time to be a young kid, uh, especially a young musician in, in Toronto. So at this point, where are you with your own playing? You just... Yeah. Had you I started, started when I was 12. Okay. So I'd, I'd been playing for a couple of years. Uh, you know, I'm still learning. Uh, very basic. We were playing, you know, John Rutsey, the original b- drummer from Rush, and we had a band called The Projection, and we played parties in basements, uh, usually my yeah. parents fixed it because we couldn't really get any gigs. And we knew, again, half a dozen songs and we just played them over and over mm-hmm. and over. We would cut lawns and stuff for two months to get some money to to rent a couple of Sykes uh, yeah. columns oh and, and a, and a yeah. Bogan amp, a vocal amp. Yeah. And we had our little tiny amps that we all plug into, you know, some one amp. One amp, the whole band, right? And, but oh, it was so great. It was so much fun and it was such an exciting oh, yeah. thing. The smell of a new amp and stuff. Oh, right? yeah. The smell of a Fender amp. Yeah, or the smell of the tubes yeah, yeah. getting hot. Yeah. And the Mandela did have some music on the radio. I was so intrigued by Donnie's sound because he used a fuzz pedal. Yeah. And boy, the, back then there weren't, yeah, I mean, distortionator. other than <laughs> yeah. the distortionator, other than maybe Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, that was the only other song that I was aware of that had a fuzz tone. Not that I knew what that was. There I just go. had no idea how they no. got that uh, sound. How do you do that? Yeah. And I really, that was part of the reason I wanted to go see them and, and to see how did he, how, how did he get that sound? So they came on and they played and they were spectacular. They were so tight. Oh. They were so energetic. They sounded amazing yeah. in that shitty arena yeah. to, to this kid anyways. <laughs> yeah. And then after their set, I went uh, just to the side stage area. They had kind of a curtain sort of thing, but I managed to poke my head through and Donnie oh, was there and I said, Mr. God. Triano, uh, could I get your autograph, please? Oh, and, and he came over and he started talking to me. Yeah. And, you know, to, he, said, he asked me, do you play guitar? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a guitarist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, and he, he signed an autograph. He gave me a, a Mandela, a little stick-on yeah. thing yeah. with the Mandela on it. Yeah. And psychedelic fluorescent. Uh, I should have brought mine. Yellow, not yellow, um, magenta green. or something. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, the green. Or maybe thing. it was green. 
Yeah, but, I get that uh, mixed up anyway. Yeah. And he gave me a pic, and and he talked to me, and yeah. I'm like just this thirteen oh, year old schmo. Why would this grown up yeah. guy talk to me? And he was very inspiring. Keep playing the guitar; it's a fantastic instrument. You know, he told me about the fuzz pe- fuzz pedal. There was a, a no name fuzz pedal I think he had built for him. Is that uh, right? And. And that was a revelation that, oh. oh my God, it's a little pedal that anybody can get. Uh-huh. Like back then, I was plugging into my parents' TV. It had a little RCA input on the back yeah. of the TV. And I, I, yeah. uh, you I know, get Jimmy to a regular guitar cord, put an RCA yeah. connector on yeah. it and plugged into the back of the TV yeah. and played it through the TV speaker. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that was my amp. Yeah. <laughs> That's, Did you, you can get speaker? that little distortion on that though. Yeah. yeah. I wanted, yeah. oh my God, I wanted a distortion pedal so badly, oh but my that was. God, me too. That was years yeah. away, yeah. But that was the first, my first experience with with Donnie. So, what did that mean That's to you lovely. as a thirteen year old kid? I'm talking about it now as a sixty five year old man. I mean, that stayed with me forever. I didn't. Uh, I don't think I. I came in contact with Donnie again until the 1980s, when there was the. Uh, Band of the Decade or Artist of the Decade Award. And that year, we were nominated or we were inducted, as was um, Katie Lang and uh, and Brian Adams. Beautiful. So from three different areas of mm-hmm. Canadian music, and the house band for that particular presentation was put together by Donnie. He got all these instruments, and they were all great Toronto players, session players for this yeah. special thing. I was there. Okay. I wasn't playing, but I was in. So, Johnny asked me to come in. Yeah. All through that night. Yeah. We're, we're, I mean, we're being <laughs> inducted. feted and yeah, inducted yeah. and the yeah. whole deal. I'm looking at Donnie going, going, oh my God. <laughs> if he only knew that, uh, like, yeah. like 20 years ago, yeah. I. He'd be proud. He'd, I'm here because of yeah, him. Of you. I know. Or oh partly because God. of him. So after we finished, I, I went up on the stage at the end of the night. And I introduced myself and I said, Donnie, I have to tell you something. You were an amazing inspiration. I told him the story I just told Aww. you. And, and he cut the smiled and chuckled and, uh, yeah. and said, well, yeah, that's, that's that's it. We're all here for the same thing. Oh, boy. And, uh, and after that, I, I, I was a little more in touch with them. And then we did Soul in the City and those sort of things. And he and I corresponded about other projects and other guitar-related things things and as he became sick you know whether that was a, a more of a concern um so my my relationship with him is it's kind of an interesting relation we weren't particularly close but i definitely have a place in my heart for him and i'll always have and always will mm-hmm. no, he's a very special he was person. a remarkable right. person yeah I mean, he was very innovative as a guitar player, as a musician, uh, his years with Bush and everything that he created there, and how he so beautifully relinquished the title of the band to the the other Bush without making a big deal about it. You know, it, was no, it wasn't no. lawsuits and all this no. the crap. That's how right. he handled that yeah. was so, yeah. so cool and classy. Yeah. And that's the way... He was. He was a very, very bright guy. I think he was very knowledgeable on a lot of things and had strong opinions on a lot of things because he's a smart guy and and just knew what the world was like and looked at it in, from so many different directions. So it's not just a, a guitar player, mm-hmm. but it's you can understand why he was so valued as an instrumentalist, as a guitarist, because of the things that he brought as a person. Can you... Can you talk to what a great guitar player he was? Like, Bernie, I, I like. can you explain to me what made him so good? Well, he played rhythm and lead equally as well. Like he was, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, there was a point in time when the mandala uh, pared down. Well, I'm sorry, the, the mandala kind of became Bush. It was Whitey and Donnie and Prakash John on bass, and Roy Kenner singing. And Roy and Whitey and Donnie had played in the Mandala, and they'd known Prakash, the bass player, forever. But at that point, 
and if you listen to their album and from talking to Donnie, whatever, the, these these guys rehearsed, like rehearsing was a very, very huge thing with him. His work ethic was uh, like Alex's, very unbelievably ethical. And so uh, he uh, had the band and, and um, played rhythm guitar. There's no keyboards. There's no uh, complimentary instruments. So he's recording and playing lead and singing at the same time with Roy and, and all that kind of stuff. So he was equally as good in that realm. So you go back to the first thing Alex was talking about with the fuzz tone. He was uh, ingenious to us as well as playing incredibly well. But, you know, when I think about Donnie, like, uh, you know, when I, I had the honor of, of kind of helping put together these seven or eight tributes we did to him to collect money for uh, the uh, Toronto East General Hospital. And uh, it was more Donnie, like, as I can't really go, well, the solo he played on Other Than Opportunity, which is the one, the very first single that Mandela had, which spun me around. I still can't play it. The B-side's even better from Toronto 67. And um, so those licks are great and everything like that. Then I became friends with them. The guitar playing uh, not became secondary because it never would or never will because I think about him every single time I strap on a guitar. I call on him when I'm playing guitar, like to come and help me do this kind of stuff. And there's like him and Hendrix and uh, maybe a few other guitar players that I have in my noggin that I just go help me. I'm, you know, what's happening now? And they give me a little, you know, I go through their discography in my brain before the next four bars shows up. So um, Donnie was in my soul that way and, and uh, becoming friends with him and, and and finding out he's like uh, Alex, a, a very beautiful, regular guy, completely unaffected by fame or, or wealth and uh, giving and all this kind of stuff. You know, I don't think Alex fi uh, f finished the story at the, at the uh, Toronto Civic Center when they were doing the induction with Donnie playing in the house band. <laughs> I can just imagine that because that was kind of like Donnie would come to the orbit room and the Dexters are playing and you know we're, we've been friends for years after that time that doesn't matter like when he walks in Donnie Tran was in the house so I have to up my game you know like there's no <laughs> flubbing you know like this is did you feel it, that pressure but in a beautiful way like it was like okay dad's here you know like I you know I had put the vodka away start <laughs> looking like you're practicing so uh and so he'd show up and he'd sit in a chair and the way the guys in the band would show up it was like he'd sit in a chair and it was almost like we'd genuflect and kiss his ring or something like that, like when he was here. But it wasn't like he was a, well, his name's Don too, like Donnie, Donnie. But he wasn't the Don. He was just like, we loved him so much. We would just huddle around him, right? It was just, and we'd ask him stuff and he would tell us everything. And everything he ever told me, I took right to heart. You know, he never lied about anything. Like you'd ask him something, he'd give you your opinion or his opinion. But yeah, like Alex, he'd call you up, he'd help you out. Do, doing stuff like that and I have one anecdote that I have to get recorded before I'm not here anymore and that is uh, when uh, Donnie was sick I would phone him every day and he'd be on his uh, he wasn't in, in the hospital yet so he was trying to he spent nine years doing a like a naturopathic uh, helping him, himself with his prostate cancer mm -hmm. And it worked very well for nine years. So, but he was on the treadmill. Every time I'd phone him in the morning, he'd be on the treadmill, right? <laughs> and uh, so he'd turn off the treadmill or still be on the treadmill talking to me on the phone or whatever. And we'd, we'd just shoot the shit for a while and he would, uh, uh, whatever, you know, I just want to see he was okay. And it was nice to hear his voice and we'd talk like friends. So, but um, he used to sub for me in the Dexters. Now, Alex knows this, he's looking at the, the guy playing in the house band while he's being inducted. Alex never mentioned he gave Donnie a, a Rush sticker and a guitar pick at the end of that show. But uh, <laughs> so uh, Donnie, like I was playing in another band as well as the Dexters at, at one time. And then there was a benefit we had to play uh, one night and I was double booked. But I led the band that I was playing on this Tuesday night. I had to 
keep that band happening that Tuesday night or we were going to lose our house gig. So I told Lou Pomani, Lou Dexter from the Dexters, I can't do this benefit. And he says, uh, oh, crap, you know, like we're usually on that benefit. You know, we've been doing it for five years. So that um, was for breast cancer. Jeff Martin used to hold it. Uh, no, I'm sorry, for um, battered women. And so uh, he says, I'll call Donnie. And I went, Donnie who? And he says, uh, I'll call Donnie Torano. I says, you want Donnie Torano to sub for me in the Dexters? <laughs> So Alex can kind of figure out what that would sound like in your head, right? <laughs> and so uh, he did. And that's the kind of guy he was. Like, that's so. Anyway, we ended up, we played so much together, and he produced a couple of things with me, and I wrote a couple of songs with him, and it, it got very tight with Donnie and his family. So uh, anyway, he phoned me up when he was sick one time to check in on me, and he kept asking me, to meet him for lunch, and we just never did it, and I, it's one of those things I'll have to remember. But uh, he said one day, and this is the thing I wanted to record, he phoned me up, and he, he would tell me how humble I was and uh, how, uh, you know, it was a, always a pleasure to play with, uh, to jam with me because uh, I would give him space to play and we were never competing and all this kind of stuff, and I'm thinking... You have no idea what you're, who you're talking to here. You know, of course, I, I'm not like that. Probably partly because of you. And uh, but then he said, uh, sometimes I think that you don't realize what a great guitar player you are. And he said that to me with his own mouth over the telephone, and I was speechless for one of the few times in my life. I, I couldn't. The pregnant pause was unbelievable. And I said, I got to go, right? And so hung the phone up, immediately called my mom <laughs> and said, Donnie Torriano, remember that guy you sat on the chair in 1967? My buddy now just phoned and said that sometimes he thinks that I don't realize what a great guitar player I am. And she went, that's really neat, Bern. And there you go. That's a nice story. That's, that really happened to me. Yeah. So that's the kind of guy he was. How did you become friends? Mm, that's a very good question. I uh, I think I was recording uh, at phase one, 1983. I was doing a solo album and uh, I must have known him slightly or one of the guys the band did or something. And uh, we just called him down to the studio. I think that's when I met him was at phase one or he was in the other room recording but it's very kind of vague, you know, because like Alex is telling the story about peeking his head in the curtain when he first saw them play. God love you for having the nerve to do that because I would have loved to have done that. I remember watching them going into the boys' change room at the gym, you know, going, they're in there, you know, but I couldn't do it. So, but I went and saw them play at a church called St. Nick's in Hamilton. It'd be 1968 or 9. George Oliver wasn't singing anymore. It was Roy Kenner up front so this is a good story too so this is the mandala roy kenner huey sullivan on keys donnie elliott on bass donnie Torano, whitey glenn so they come out i'm got my chin up to the stage right like i was the first guy there you know so i'm waiting for donnie to come in and they had just uh come out with their soul crusade album the only album the mandala ever made but first song, World of Love, has a chord in it, which was an A6 chord, right? I had no idea what that chord was. To me, it was just another, like, Toriano played all these beautiful sharp nines like, like Hendrix did, but in a soul manner. But then after this bump, bump, he goes down, and then there's this note in there. It goes down, 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 and, it, and I knew that the, song, that the chord was an A, and I'm thinking, how the heck do you get the do in there, right? I couldn't figure it out. So I go to St. Nick's because I know they're playing and I'm going to be there to watch them play that song so I could stare at his hands, right? Like, I'm sure Alex and I learned a lot by staring at people's hands, their positioning, right? So they play the song. <laughs> he goes down, it's before cell phone, so I have to put it in my brain, right? It was the first song of the show too. 
What the heck did he do there? Okay. Oh, he moved his baby finger down one fret. Get out of here. So I run home after the gig, right? Yeah, get my guitar in. Got the can out. No way. I learned another triano chord, right? So it's like, great. So I was on my way. That chord I've used all the rest of my life, right? Every time I heard it in a song, I go, I know that. I know what that chord is. So the little anecdote, you're going to have to edit this song, but I had so many stupid Mandela stories. So Roy's singing. They start the show and they got... Roy Kenner does a, a David Lee Roth. He's, they open the curtain on the church stage and he's standing on top of the custom special, Roy, in his striped outfit and everything like that. Jumps up, does the splits, lands on the stage, lets out a blood-curdling scream <laughs> because he landed wrong <laughs> and they carry him off the stage. <laughs> 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 so... There's no Roy. So all of a sudden I'm watching almost Bush at this point, right? It's Donnie, Whitey, uh, Donnie Elliott, and, and Huey Sullivan. And they play a whole bunch of stuff. They finish the set without Roy, but they play everything instrumentally. It's a dream to me, right? I like Roy, but I get to watch Johnny the whole set, right? So I'm just like, oh my God, this is beautiful. But this may be the first time I ever spoke to Donnie. I'm still 14, 15 years old, so... There's a little dressing room about the size of a bathroom just off the church stage there. And so uh, I go to the door when they all left the stage because Roy hadn't come back. And so I knock on the door very timidly and whatever, and the door opens. They're all like sitting on boxes and <laughs> like some of the beautiful dressing rooms Alex and I have <laughs> shared stories about. And so they're all sitting on boxes and everything. And Roy is, is there with an ice pack on his crunch, right? Just sitting there, <laughs> sweat pouring off his brow and everything like that. And I just went, are you okay, Mr. Ketter? You know, and uh, Donnie comes out and uh, he says, yeah, we're going to be okay. And I'm going, well, will you, um, you know, could you, you going to be playing another show? You know, and uh, so I think they went and did another set without Roy. Like he was incommunicado. Yikes. Probably for a few gigs. <laughs> but I still talk. I, I know Roy now, so I get to, to my, remind him about that every time <laughs> I see him. <laughs> so that was kind of the way I met Donnie. So Donnie was nice to me that day, too. So I realized. But uh, I got no pick, no sticker. <laughs> but I did see a nice pack on Roy's crotch, though. <laughs> so going back to that incident where, where you met Donnie for the first time, I'm sure there's been many fans who've come up to you. Are you ever reminded of that moment where, when a kid comes to you and asks for your the, your autograph? Yeah. And... yeah, I try to be gracious. I try you to are. return it. Huh. You know, I try to keep the karma going. Uh, I mean, certainly learned something from Donnie that time. Huh. What we've learned from a lot of experiences yes. over the years. Uh, it's easy to be an asshole boy and sometimes it's easy to be an asshole when you don't really mean to be right yeah. uh, and you have to be aware of that you know your fans love you they just want a moment of your time generally which you can relate to because yeah you've been there exactly yeah i didn't want to hang around with donnie and you know <laughs> i just wanted to tell him that i really admired him and respected him mm -hmm. and loved what he was doing and i was excited because i was a young kid who wanted to be like that and and he responded with the way that I hopefully have responded you do. throughout my career. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Alex gets me tickets when they play, and I, I get to hang out front and, and often uh, even slide backstage and eat some of their food and things when they're on stage. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have. <laughs> well, you're the one. <laughs> I'm the one that doesn't put the saran wrap back over the tray. <laughs> so you get the heart below you. And so... Uh, uh, so Alex is playing, right? You know, there was one time he invited me upstage and gave me a headphone mix while they're playing at uh, the amphitheater. And uh, this is like Alex and me hitting it off like brothers, like the first time we met, you know, like I named a big Al Dexter. Like it just came off my lips when we were playing at the Orbit Room. And he's been big Al to me forever and whatever. So I, I'm up on Ontario Place and I'm looking out at this there's not a you couldn't squeeze one more person onto the grass or anything it's just full of people all 
playing air guitar, playing air drums, singing every <laughs> lyric, holding lighters up, like, and I'm just loving it. And and Alex and all the other, and then he invites me up to the uh, the dressing room. I go up the elevator, and he's you know getting changed for the thing. He shoots the shit with me. He's only got twenty minutes to have a pee and shower and stuff like that. But we're just talking like old buddies, right? And I'm trying not to invade his space because. I don't know what kind of space you're in when you do a three hour show and mm-hmm. there's a million people looking at you and stuff. It must be astounding. So um, he's like that too, you know? So if it's Donnie that rubbed off on him, I think you have to have it in your heart. Plus it's dealing with weirdos our entire lives and, and deciding at some point whether we wanted to be an asshole or whether we thought, mm-hmm. Why burn bridges and just try to stay away from these toxic people if you can uh, do that? Or just know how to deal and try to be diplomatic when you can. Lie if you have to, just to get them off your back to go away. And uh, carry on and, and don't take your gig home with you. Don't get big headed. Just you're lucky you're doing what you're doing. You know, I was driving here today and I saw some guys on a freaking scaffold on the, on the dome, the, the sky dome, with squeegees cleaning the freaking canvas, right? And I'm yeah. driving here and I'm going, oh, I'm in a car. Like there's a traffic on the gardener. And then I look over at those guys and I'm going, I'm going to do an interview with my friend Al and Mako and everybody and Gary. I could be doing that, at the, being on that scaffold. I think <laughs> I'm doing okay. Yes. <laughs> um. I did want to ask about that. When you play to, we used to playing to thousands or tens of thousands Throngs, of people. Yeah. Do you ever miss just playing to a small group? Like when you play, I know you do a lot of studio work, but it's not like you can just get the guys together and play. Or do you do that? They played with the Dexters a lot. Yeah, uh, doing that with the Dexters gave me that that buzz for sure. I loved doing that. Uh, I was always very nervous about it because it wasn't where I came from. Yeah. So one of the problems I've had is that I only know Rush songs. I never really had <laughs> sure. to learn covers because we, I mean, other than playing bars and stuff in the early seventies, you know, and even then we were writing like 80% of our material was original material and any covers we did, we really did strange covers. We did a cover of uh, For What It's Worth, for example, that was 20 minutes long. And it was a jam and it was a whole kinds of stuff. So I never learned songs. You know, I never learned those R&B standards that the Dexters would play. And uh, I, I know I was, I'd bug Bernie and, and Lou to send me a list whenever they got it. And they were like, Nah, we'll just yeah. figure it out on the night because yeah. they knew all like 10,000 yeah. songs <laughs> and Lou would call them out and then the guys would play them. I'd be like, oh, what key is that in? Uh, and I would watch Bernie like the whole night. Where are his hands going? Uh, okay, it's in A or it's in B. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I can just move around in that key if I don't really know the song. There were a lot of times that I really didn't know how to play the song that we were playing. No. But I would yell I out knew... the wrong chords to make it sound really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew enough about, you know, where I should be on the guitar to complement what he was playing. So I could play harmonies or, or some sort of background and, and get by. But I got to say, those gig, there was one gig. I don't know if it was around New Year's or if it was even a, a, maybe a New Year's gig. Yeah. Where the place was packed. I mean... I think we were actually licensed for 80 and we probably had 130 people in there. Mm-hmm. It was packed, yeah. dangerously packed. Yeah, and the, there, there were people right up to the front mm-hmm. of our platform. Yeah. I don't, can't call it a stage. No. Oh, no. <laughs> it was only about eight yeah. inches high. That's and right. there were people just right up mm-hmm. to us. And we were sweating. It was hot. And it we were doing shots crazy. and you, playing. Yeah. And it was one of the greatest gigs <laughs> I think yeah. I've ever That's done. That's awesome. It was wow. so much fun, yeah. which is what it's supposed to be all about. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, yeah, I, I, I would get that kind of buzz from, from doing those gigs. But other than that, not really. You know, Rush, uh, once we started touring in 74, we, we did smaller venues. When I say smaller, I mean smaller uh, theaters, mm-hmm. 
2,000 seat, 3,000. And we gradually worked our way up. Uh, we opened for a lot of big acts that were playing in big arenas. So that was sort of our our home. And we felt comfortable in that, mm. in that, for lack of a better term, arena. Mm -hmm. That was really how we geared our show. That was the intimate place for us to play. And we looked at it as uh, this 14,000 seat arena is way more intimate than the 60,000 seat uh stadium <laughs> Good so God. we're actually playing a smaller gig <laughs> yeah really. and, uh, the few it, it, times it, it, that it, we we did smaller gigs they were they were a bit of a, a headache huh. and uh and they were okay i yeah. i enjoyed it but i didn't never felt this overriding need to need. to you know yeah. play a small gig and intimate like right yeah. there it Can never I really occurred to me an, just a short anecdote or a long one about that like that gig in rio because I, I want to know that, that feeling. Well, that, that tour was the uh, the return tour after the, the tragedy that Neil had gone through and we recorded uh, Vapor Trails. And that was the very end of the Vapor Trails tour. We did a few dates in South America. And you, just, you decided at that point that there were other parts of the world you hadn't been to before that it was worth checking out, right? Well, yeah. The, th the thing is we never had any kind of indication of a popularity in South America. Very hard to tell because uh, pirating is so rampant there oh. and always has been. So if, if you want to mm. look at your legitimate sales mm -hmm. as an indicator of your popularity and whether you should make an effort to, to travel that distance yeah. to, to play very limited number of gigs. Mm. Same thing with Australia. Huh. We would have loved to have gone, but we never felt we had... Uh, Gotcha. The the wow. the um, support mm -hmm. to to do a, a very limited tour. Okay. So, sorry, South America. Drop, but does that surprise you? So that if you're big in North America and you're big in UK, and then for whatever reason, does you're not sure how big you are in Australia? Does that seem strange to you? Uh, the pirating little, thing though was an issue. Like you can't get in South stats, America. Right? It was pirating. Right. So if we spoke to our record company. Yeah. How are our sales? Mm -hmm. Oh, you you do a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. You do about a hundred thousand yeah. on, but there's on a your five record. Five million bootlegs. Out there. Yeah, and we're thinking, well, we're going to go all that way. It's going to cost us a lot of money to go and do those gigs for maybe you know ten thousand people mm -hmm. if we can get them out to a gig. Mm -hmm. So we had no idea until we heard from a pro the promoters that always wanted us to go down for. Rock and Rio, the big mm -hmm. festival that they would do every uh, February, I think it was. And we didn't want to do that because we we had a long show. We wanted complete control over our, uh, how we present our show. So we didn't want to be on a festival where we played oh. for an hour with our gear stacked up in front of somebody else and all of that stuff. Yeah. So the promoter said, you, you guys can do some business. You should come out. I'll, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. Wow, cool. So we went and we played. Uh, and um, boy, yeah. we, you know, we had 65,000 people God. in Sao Paulo and uh, Porto Alegre, which is a smaller uh -huh. uh, city. There was 25,000 people Jeez. there. We had uh, almost 50,000 in Rio for that recording of that show. Uh, so it was really a surprise to us that we were that popular. Th and the thing is, if if you, for example, if you look at the um, video that we did of Russian Rio, YYZ, which is uh, an instrumental song, mm -hmm. when we were mixing it, we'd pull the band tracks down and just listen to the audience because they were singing along <laughs> to the melody of and YYZ. Jesus. The whole crowd was bouncing yeah, up and down for the noticed, entire that... song. Oh my God. It was such... An indication yeah. of the passion yeah. that fans have there, and what you've done it was, to them. It was it was kind of scary. Yeah, it would be when we were there. I mean, people they were rabid. They were rabid. There were, there were thousands of people at the airport when we arrived. And <gasps> no, yeah, it was. Like wow, the Beatles Alex, or something. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh it was goodness. it was astonishing. Wow, it was really really astonishing. Um, but you have really dedicated fans. Huh. Yeah, that's oh, an understatement. Probably more than any other band. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that the Dead Heads are are even more um, uh, rabid. 
Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, I think our our fans are very very loyal, and they really take it as a as a badge of honor to be. Uh, yep. Sorry to be uh, to be Rush fans, <laughs> right. and they've always been very vocal about how they feel about the band, and mm. they're they're not shy to let us know when they think that we're going in the wrong direction or we haven't done something <laughs> that is up yeah. to the standards and yeah. all of that stuff. That's cool. That is. If I hear from a fan that wow. you sucked that night, yeah. and I know we did, yeah, then I totally respect that. Yeah, but if it's uh some you know hater reviewer yeah. who hates us because yeah. of getty's vocals on the first album yeah. 20 yeah. or 30 years later Absolutely. then that does that just does not make sense yeah. to me right. no. go, go ahead and hate us if you want but if you're going to be a, a a legitimate reviewer and critic then do your job yeah. you know give valid reasons for for hating us mm -hmm. but do you even care about critics when you have such a loyal fan base oh uh, it always bothers you you can say no, that doesn't that, that doesn't really affect me. Yeah. But at the, the end of the day, when you do read a review, especially from 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 a, a, a critic that you respect, right? Uh, and they're just so nasty mean, and yeah. so mean spirited, cruel, yeah. That they don't take into yeah. account that you spent six months writing, rehearsing, going over the whole thing, playing that one song for three weeks every day for 16 hours to get it perfect that you've invested so much of your energy and your emotion and your heart to make something as good as you can if you don't like it that's fine you don't have to like it but you don't have to be mean about your dislike mm -hmm. and rush was a great target for a lot of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. after a while we it just rolled off our back and in fact we kind of looked forward to that and our fans loved it because they felt like they were onto something that was really special that the world didn't know about and if this big shot critic hates them i love them that much more neat kind of like the trump syndrome actually mm -hmm. yeah. you know in, in a lot of ways yeah, if you look base, at his core base, yeah. supporters it almost doesn't it doesn't matter what he says or does they will always yeah you know support him there's that kind of intense loyalty. It is. I like to think Ali. that we're no, maybe a little more <laughs> weird stuff, value no. to rush than to Donald Trump. But. No. Yeah. Um, I, would I don't know if I can speak for Gary, but I grew up in Willowdale. So, you know, for me, growing up and Rush was just coming up and like you were our band, mm. you know. And, and in fact, my bass player, when I played band, I think used to babysit for you. Oh, really? Many, many years ago <laughs> when you were first starting out. So there was this connection with the band, and we, I was always thinking that you guys are huge all over. But like, it surprised me when I watched the documentary that it took until twenty one twelve until you guys actually started making money. I'm not even sure if you made money then, but it just seemed like it was a tough go for the first three or four albums. Yeah, you know, twenty one twelve was definitely our first uh, successful record financially, and and for a lot of reasons, but didn't happen overnight no the sales were very slow on 2112 we continued to tour as much as we could and play and slowly word of mouth started to happen mm -hmm. and things it took about a year 14 months before that record finally went gold Gee. i mean it was a it was a long build with that record and then after that it really took off okay and uh uh and, and with the follow-up records people then would go back to 2112 and and it just continued that that uh, momentum so how back did then. you made, how did you manage to keep the band together for so long like i find that amazing that's yeah. for sure <laughs> well you know first of all getty and i are best friends and we always have been we met in junior high school we played both of us plugged into his amp usually at his place sometimes at my place after school almost every day we painted our guitars so that they would look like jack bruce's and eric clapton's oh. you know although they didn't <laughs> <laughs> because those guys didn't paint their guitars by yeah. the way they got what? a professional yeah. artist to do it but uh so you know we shared so much together music our lives growing up our backgrounds, all that stuff. He's my soulmate and, and my dearest and closest friend. Um, 
when Neil joined the band in 74, it was exciting. It was a new beginning for us. We could kind of open up to the kind of music that that we wanted to play. We didn't want to be stuck in that kind of basic rock mold that, that John really wanted us to continue in, like Bad Company, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, we wanted to feel our influences, Pink Floyd, Yes, mm-hmm. Genesis, all that, that kind of stuff mm-hmm. that was happening around us. We're all from a similar middle class, lower middle class background with a good work ethic, parents who worked hard. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot from from that in in each of our cases. Mm -hmm. Neil's a very, very bright guy, very well read. He was, you know, very different from from Getty and I. He was very shy, very introverted in a lot of ways, but a fabulous musician, very thoughtful. So when the job came to writing lyrics and he agreed to do it it was a big relief for getting me because that was not our strength we we could we realized that was not our strength and never has been but the music team of getty and me was important and that's what we really wanted to develop from our end so it was great that neil could actually write really interesting mm. thoughtful lyrics as well as be an amazing drummer mm-hmm. Uh, we worked so hard in those early years. We were doing 250 shows a year for those first probably four or five years that we we toured. Yes, and we didn't make any money until after 2112. We were heavily in debt for those first three or four years. In fact, I remember a point in 1976 where we didn't get paid f- and we were only making a hundred bucks a week. Mm-hmm. But we didn't get paid for six months, zero. Uh, my what I we got I got married. We we got a little bit of money for our wedding, mm-hmm. and we lived off that. Five dollars a week was what we had left in our budget. Now, and this is in the mid seventies, so five dollars was like fifty or sixty dollars, I guess now. But it it was tough. So you did things that didn't cost anything, and I had two kids, and you know that was a very very difficult time, and I and uh, we all worried about that, but we persevered. Yes. Did you ever? I asked this to all the musicians I interviewed, but did you ever question what you were doing and did you ever think about quitting? After Crest of Steel, uh, there was a real funk. The record didn't do very well commercially. For us, uh, artistically, it was a really important stepping stone. We needed to go through that and try some things with the Fountain of Lamb, that's the whole side mm-hmm. dedicated to a, to a concept and theme. The Necromancer, you know, that... that uh, that came before, same thing, longer format, broken up into parts. So we were just feeling our way into a, a bigger idea. Um, but it, it was not very successful. And we we were really struggling. Uh, shows weren't doing well. The tour wasn't doing well. We, we called it our Down the down Tubes tour. And I remember we had you know these meetings amongst the three of us sitting either in the car driving to a gig or in a dressing room. And we were kind of despondent, but I clearly remember this one time where we were in a dressing room, and it might have been in Sault Ste. Marie, in fact, with uh, with uh, Mendelssohn Joe opening for us. And we decided, okay, we can either give in to the pressure from the record company and management was worried they'd invested a lot of money in us too to cover our bills that wasn't coming in we can either make the first record again sort of a zeppelin clone thing uh or else we can just say screw you and do whatever we think is right for us and at least we'll go down in flames uh and they'll they will be our own flames Hmm. I can go back to working for my dad in plumbing mm-hmm. if I have to. And Neil could go back to working in tractor business and mm. uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Getty could go back to his mom's yeah. uh, variety store. Yeah, she... But that was, you know, that was the idea. We'll just, we'll, this this is all about us and we need to, to make a statement here. And that's what 2112 is. It's our protest record. And that's, it's all about that. It's all about, you know, standing up to the man, standing up to the institutions that were trying to put us down and, and try to smother our creativity and our individuality. Uh, so that's what 2112 was. And, and when it when we did it, when it came out, we fully expected to go down the tubes 
uh, in in flames. Wow. But that's not what happened. And instead, what happened was we established our independence. Never was the record company ever in the studio in all the years that we worked. Ray was only in the studio once. And this was after the whole thing with Neil when he came by. And I don't know, he, he brought something or something. He brought lunch or something. <laughs> okay. We let him in. Yeah. Ray being your manager. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we ne- were never influenced That's by fantastic. anyone outside of the band when it came to our material and what we wanted to do Gee. with it. And looking back on our recordings, we, there are lots of things we could have done so much better. There are a lot of things we could have really left off records. But we wanted to try things. We wanted to experiment. We wanted to feel like we were going somewhere and not staying in the same place. Which is pretty amazing because a lot of bands wouldn't take that trip. Oh, I'm just because... saying you're listening to a master here, like talking not offhandedly about it because the work is... <laughs> I the think, work happened. I so. think because we, we established our independence with 2112, it allowed us to do things. We took on responsibility for where our careers were going to go. Hmm. And the record company, with the success of 2112, you know, was part of their five-record deal when we signed with Mercury Records in the first place. Hmm. So it had come to fruition. Their, their plan for us. Wow. You know, we actually fit the plan. We, we, we took a big dip instead of, uh, you know, a more linear rise. But we came right back up with that. So we were like, okay, let's leave these guys alone. They think they know what they're doing. The records are being sold. We're making money. Let's just stay out of it and let them do Boy. whatever they want to do. And that was key because that was not the case for most bands back then. Boy. Today, it's a different story. It but sure is. Back then. And I think when bands throughout the 80s and 90s and 2000s cited us as an influence, I think it was more about that than about our... Yeah. or musicality yeah. or about our style of playing or or any any of that they look at us and they think well if rush can do it mm. doing what they do then i can too i just need to stick to my guns and for for me particularly through the 90s hearing of all those bands from the grunge era that would cite us I and mean, these were bands that i really respected the musicians i respected to hear them say that that when I when I, we just started out, we looked at Rush and they they did it on their own, mm-hmm. playing the material that they play, which is not for everybody, and they did it happily and they still exist and that's what I'm gonna use as a template. So that's great. It is great. So you know, there's a clip I, I have with Dominic talking about what advice he would give to a young musician, and he said it's got to be about music. I'm, I will I will insert this here. Mm-hmm. You got to be persistent. You got to really, and per- persistent in the sense of, well, p- before the persistence, you got to really want to be doing this like for the right reasons. And the right reason is that you want to play. Everything else has got to be secondary. I'm going to make money. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to be, that's all secondary. That's all fun. It's all neat. It's all great if and when it happens. But if that's the reason to do it, you're going to run into so many brick walls because it's not easy. And if that's the only motivation, you're going to fall by the wayside, which most people do. If you really want to play, then that's all that matters. All this other stuff is secondary, and you'll play. So you got to, first of all, this is what I want to do. Then if it is what you want to do, just like anything else in life, you got to be persistent, and you got to work at it. It's work. You know, Wayne Gretzky... Talk about gifted. I'm sure he was gifted. But, you know, you read about Wayne Gretzky. From the time he was three years old, he's out skating like 10 hours a day. I mean, he wasn't working. He was having a good time probably. But it was work. Most people look at it and go, God, how can you do that? You know, because I know people in my, in my family, like my, my, my aunts would say, oh, how can you be in the studio for 12 hours? You work so hard. I thought, I'm not working hard. <laughs> I mean, I've never worked a day in my life. But they look at the time you're putting in, and it's hard work. So... If you're lucky enough that what you like to do is not work, then you'll put in the, the time. And that's where the persistence like comes in. So I think, it's, I think I would tell anybody, that's what I would say to them right now. First, make sure this is what you want to do. And if it is what you want to do, then spend as much time as you can doing it. I mean, life catches up to you. You know, I mean, when you're 15, you're living at home, it's one thing. You know, all of a sudden you're 20 and maybe you're out on your own. You got your own apartment. You meet a girl. You get married. I mean, you know, life, you get responsibilities. You got to take care of things. 
But, you know, even those things, a guy like Wes Montgomery, I read, started playing very late, had a family. George Benson had kids. Didn't stop them from practicing and getting good. You know what I mean? So if you want to do it, you'll find a way. I, I think that's the key. Basically, it's got to be about the music and nothing else. If you're thinking about fame, then you're not in it for the right reason. But I wonder, like, you, you've reached the fame and the rock stardom. Was that ever a goal? Or what was the goal for you when you were starting, if you don't mind me asking? I'll be honest with you. The goal was always to be a better musician. We set a high standard, and we really pushed each other mm. to play as best as we could. Um, I mean, we there were so many times in the studio where we just struggled over parts, trying to play it the way we, we intended it hmm. until we got it. And there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, that, literally bleeding fingers. Huh. That was that was the essence of what we wanted to do. It wasn't about the fame. The fame uh -huh. was great and everything, uh -huh. yeah. uh, if it came, but... When we were opening three act shows for played for twenty minutes, mm. we just wanted to play the best that we could. It wasn't about being cocky and yeah. and you know pick up chicks and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be a great band, a great players, and that was the the key for us right to the the very end. I mean, the, yeah, the fame came and the financial stability and all of that stuff that does come with doing any job well and do, uh, and dedicating yourself to it but it was always at the core being a, a great musician and as best as you can be did it ever change you change me yeah and... like what like so when the, when when you got this the fame or the stardom does that change a person oh my god it's yeah for sure it does or it can uh and i'm i'm, I'm sure it has I've i've always tried to be grounded and down to earth um i don't know if i always have been but that's always been a goal uh i just try to be true to myself now having kids early getting married early you know i've been married for 43 years i've been with my wife for 50 years she was my first girlfriend um you came home from being a rock star to taking the kids to school and stop by and pick up the laundry and also just, you know, pop into Loblaws and grabs, you know, it's all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't get too busy because you got to go pick up the kids after school. Like like normal, Life everyday stuff, yeah. people yeah. do. It's one thing to be out on the road and be surrounded by people that do everything for okay. you. And then another set of people that just tell you how great you are all the time. But come home and get a reality check. And that's what life is really about. <sighs> For all the wonder and excitement that being in Rush has been, it was a job. It was a career that I wanted to have. And I loved it. And I was so fortunate. I look back on how lucky I was to never have grown up, <laughs> you know, to be surrounded by young people mostly and to have a youthfulness about the kind of work that I was doing. Music, that's what music is. Mm. And... Uh, and, and that was never lost on me. But I had a very grounding life at home. Getty, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And and Neil as well. So, yeah. you know, it, it was, you know, to go back your, to your other question about what kept us together, it's those sort of things. It was our work ethic. It, it was our family lives. It was our commitment to music and, and being good parents and being good people. Uh, having a strong sense of ethics, you know, you always fail somewhere. You always let yourself down throughout life, but it's how you pick yourself back up and how you make yourself that much better. You know, one step back, two steps forward. Um, and hopefully, you know, it's something that, that we accomplished. We also had a great sense of humor that was common amongst the three of us. We spent 90% of the time together. I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. Just laughing, laughing our heads off. Beautiful. And that, you know, yep. that makes you want to get back together. Mm -hmm. That makes, after a long, grueling tour and you're off for a couple months and you go back out, mm -hmm. it's like, hey, yeah. you know, Show you're just, yeah, know. you just yeah. can't wait because you uh -huh. love those guys. Uh -huh. You love being with them. And, and you still hang out with them. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I talked to Ged this morning and yeah. um, I'm going to, to uh, Cleveland with him for his book, one of his book signing things. Um, we're going to do it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, in fact. Nice. And I'm going to conduct the interview with him. So, oh. so yeah, we're always doing something together. Uh, we both went to see Neil in the fall, you know, to visit him uh, for a few days. And so, yeah, we we stay clearly in touch all the That's time. That's amazing. Mm. I mean, just knowing somebody from junior high, you know, and having that bond all this. Mm. I don't know that many people. No, they live their no, lives doesn't usually happen. together. Yeah. Like, they're, they're married, right? And can like you imagine yeah. being in a band for this long? Uh, I dreamt about it. And uh, like uh, Alex was saying, that motivated me. Like, I never p- put a band together or was in a band waiting for it to break up. Like, it, I mean, you never thought oh. past your nose, right? So, uh, or past the gig you were doing. But uh, yeah, so that never came into the picture. But Alex's work ethic and, uh, you know, uh, here's a little ditty here. Like uh, somebody who is uh, uh, likes my playing, for instance, or whatever, and they know that I know Alex. And uh, they're going, uh, well, you know, I heard him play Smoke on the Water once and I heard you play Smoke on the Water once and, you know, I think you killed it, right? You know, he sucked. No, I still, you don't like him going, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm making Smoke on the Water up, by the way. It's not, it's just... Uh, <laughs> That's a good example. Though. Yeah, that is a good example. Because <laughs> I suck playing that. I but... suck worse. <laughs> and so, so uh, yeah, so I go, you know what? When I was down in my mom's basement with, uh, you know, buying uh, hopefully, uh, you know, some vinyl that week or whatever, and, you know, sitting down and learning licks off records and stuff like that, I said, Alex was writing songs at that point. I said, you know, I've written some songs in my life, but it's I'm not a songwriter compared to what Alex and Ked do together. Like, they're a songwriting team. They've got a legacy, a history, and the they tell stories on you know one side of a whole album and things like that I'm, and i mean uh, neil as well of course but uh, so i always back that up by going no nah, it's got nothing to do with who killed what it's like i come from i uh, got the same work ethic i mean alex and i have the same kind of upbringing and and uh soul i believe i think it goes that deeply for for us so anyway but it's it's just that and like i, I would have been buddies with him if i'd met him when i was 15 right like, i feel that so mm-hmm. um but uh and the laughing would definitely be there <laughs> i could just picture it yeah oh my goodness <laughs> yeah yeah what that when did bernie die oh yeah it was years ago but uh <laughs> but god that was a laugh did you ever see the way he went out oh man so uh uh yeah so it's it's that kind of um wherever i was going with that there i it was a great little anecdote <laughs> oh yeah the smoke on the water thing so i go yeah you know i was learning crap off records i was trying to learn some of his licks he was writing those licks so he's like he's another thing right you know to me like you know we both play guitar we both love the instrument equally as well we had different we had different goals for our careers, right? I remember the when they used to play K Tell records on TV, you know, the, the five hundred songs on one album, you know, like by all uh, by all original artists, and it was never original artists. It was always some guys at Sound Canada, at the eight track studio in Toronto. I, I ended up meeting them later on in my life, and I would listen to that, and I'm eleven, and I go, I want to be the guitar player playing on records like that. Like I want to, I want to. Like, I want to get the hit record, and then I want to copy that hit record and nail it. Like, I, I'm that kind of a guy. Like, I like making stuff up, too. Don't get me wrong. But I learned my chops by learning the mistakes on records and the tones and the phrasings and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Alex and Getty are down the basement going, uh, well, okay, you know, let's blend Yes and Pink Floyd together. And plus, I got an idea for this. And... And my fingers go like here, and how about your fingers go? No, not there, Ged. Oh, here, I said. Here, here, here. Take off that third string. You don't need that. Right? And then they do it that way, and different lifestyles that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I really admire it to beyond comprehension. That's my story. Well, you didn't do too bad on no, yourself. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I'm going to close off. I want to thank you both for doing this. 
I, I'm, it's a thrill for me to, be, to have both of you here. Well, thank you. And Alex is here too, don't <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you for having me along with Bernie. <laughs> Bernie Lou? <laughs> I'm going to close off with, um, with a quote from um, Dominic talking about moments in, in his life, special moments. So that I'll just end the piece that way. But thank you so much for doing that. A pleasure. Thanks. My pleasure too. You know, there's been a lot and I can look at different points in my life and as you get, you know, you, you're developing and different things appeal to you. I mean, going w like way back and looking at why you get started in the first place, you'd say those are some of the most important ones because it got you started. I mean, Johnny Be Good for me was like an epiphany, you know, like, uh, and I can't even tell you why, you know, it's, it's as much as being a kid, you know, you're a kid and you start liking a hockey team because you like the sweater, the colors are cool. Or I used to like Montreal because I thought the names were great. You know, Rocket Richard, Boom Boom Jeffrey. I'm like all the French names, Jean Beliveau. I mean, it sounded exotic to me. Like I was telling you about the music, like the blues stuff always sounded, you know, Biloxi, Mississippi. Somehow that sounded more exotic than, than, than Kitchener, Ontario to me. So if I looked at a moment that, you know, I saw Chuck Berry doing Johnny Be Good on TV and something about it just reached into me. The lyric, this poor kid learning to play guitar from the backwoods, becomes a big star, his name's in lights. The lyric, the music just did something to me. You can't even really describe music emotionally, why it, it digs deep into your soul or it doesn't, it did. Just hearing that, I mean, just, I don't know, just, I just got goosebumps, you know, and, uh, so that was that was a very important moment. That? And there's there there have been several of those along the years. When I first heard guys like BB King and Freddie King and Albert King bending a note, I mean it was like electric to me. And I can think of those things like all th Freddie, Albert, and BB were probably my big big influences when I started playing playing guitar. Uh, after because by the time I started playing guitar, Chuck was kind of already passed in my head. You know, I mean that was my formative being a kid just loving music when I started playing I, I, I played some Chuck Berry stuff but I, I got into the blues stuff like uh, really quick and the blues things when I remember hearing those records and just hearing going bum, 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 bending a note I was like whoa I mean the sound what is that you know I think everything I've ever done I mean blues is at a core of everything that I've done I mean I've it's gone a lot of different ways but I mean to me I'm still kind of a blues guy who's kind of expanded in a lot of different areas but emotionally, the stuff that always got me was that. Whether it was B.B. King or Ray Charles, because the, the Ray Charles was, was blues. I mean, the early Ray Charles stuff, with, with, like with gospel. That gospel and blues kind of became R&B. And um, so all those moments, you know, I, I, there's so many I could give you. And some, some are names like uh, that you know, and some are, you know, I get these obscure records. And I remember I had a record was obscure to me at the time, because I didn't know who he was, by Johnny Guitar Watson, a 78, called... Uh, I know someone cares for me. Da, 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 da. And this guitar thing came in. It was just like, I just jumped every time I heard it. I wore the record out trying to figure it out. So those kind of things that something really grabs you emotionally and you're learning from it. Because to me, every time I would hear something I didn't know, it was like a whole other world op 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 like opening up again. You know, it was like, it's like being off the planet almost. You know, it's like traveling in space. Every time I would hear these licks I wouldn't understand, it's like a new world. And I was just fascinated by it. Just That's the best way I can describe it, it was like a new world. So I say the Chuck Berry moment because it was the formative time, but there's been a lot of those over the years. And most of them probably when I was younger. Because I think this stuff happens when you're younger. Things hit you that way a lot more. As you get older, I don't think you get blasé is the word. You just, you know, you're more used to things. So it doesn't hit you the same way.